Are there some ethical truths that are inescapable? Whenever we argue, do we presuppose a set of values? And if so, do those values push you towards libertarian political conclusions? These are the questions I'm trying to answer on the 50th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the show. I'm Steve Patterson, your host. Today we're talking about political philosophy, political ethics, and we're talking about a specific idea that I've gotten lots and lots of requests to cover. I am persuaded by libertarian ideas, really rather extreme libertarian ideas. And the natural question arises, why? What's the justification for libertarian conclusions? Now, I have my own set of justifications, but I know lots of libertarians who are persuaded by what is called argumentation ethics, which is an attempt to make a rationalist argument for a particular set of ethical values. And by rationalist, I mean there are certain foundational principles that we discover that are inescapable, and then we use logical deduction to see what follows from there. Now, if you guys have been following my work, you know that sounds like why it would be a natural fit within the worldview that I'm trying to create, but I struggle with accepting some of the foundational premises that are presented by people arguing for argumentation ethics. So I've gotten lots of requests from people saying, bring on Stefan Kinsella. He's one of the more prominent libertarians who is a vocal proponent of argumentation ethics. So he and I had a fantastic conversation on the subject. Now, in the course of this interview, given that my guest and I are both on the same page on large parts of our political theory, if you're not already down with libertarianism, you probably won't find this persuasive at all. So this is definitely a little bit more inside baseball for those who are more disposed towards libertarian conclusions. But even if you're not in the libertarian bandwagon, I'm sure this conversation will elicit some insightful thoughts in your mind. There are lots of show notes for this particular episode, so if you want to learn more about argumentation ethics, check out steve-patterson.com 50. That will link you to Stefan Kinsella's page, some of the arguments from a gentleman named Hans Hermann Hoppe, who gets a lot of credit for coming up with argumentation ethics, at least in this form. You'll also find a link to the sponsor of this episode, which is the company currently in the process of changing the world, Praxis. If you are like me, and you're in school right now, let's say you're getting your undergraduate degree, and you are unsatisfied with your college experience because the professors, maybe they don't know what they're talking about or not making good arguments, your peers have heads full of cobwebs, you're frustrated with the amount of busy work and inertia in the academic system, take heart, my friend, Praxis is made for you. If you want to stop wasting your time in academia and you want to go straight into the real world to get actual relevant job training and get paid off the get-go, the Praxis program is a three-month boot camp where you learn relevant things about the world that are applicable to your job, and then it's followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship. And you make enough money getting paid at this apprenticeship where you can fully pay for the cost of the Praxis program. So it is massively superior, in my mind, to going and getting your degree in college. So if that sounds like you, check out steve-patterson.com slash praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. So I hope you enjoy my interview with Stefan Kinsella, who is a patent attorney, libertarian legal theorist. And one of the things that he's written that I very highly recommend is a book called Against Intellectual Property. I haven't done an episode on intellectual property yet on this show. I certainly will do one in the future, and maybe I'll have Stefan back on the show to talk about it. But it's become kind of standard canon in a lot of libertarian circles, and for good reason. Fun and arbitrary trivia fact about my guest's name today. If you've seen some of his writing, his author name is sometimes N. Stefan Kinsella. Hmm, what does the N stand for? Well, you're about to find out. Mr. Norman Stefan Kinsella, welcome to Patterson in Pursuit. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. Glad to be here. So I get a lot of requests from people to talk to different thinkers. And a big part of my audience is they come from a libertarian background. And when talking about libertarian issues, libertarian ethics, 
uh, there's this one concept that always comes up, argumentation ethics. And when I talk to people about it and they say, man, you got to have Stefan Kinsella on the show. So it's a real it's a real delight to have you on. I want to be totally in the rationalist ethics camp, and I'm mm-hmm. hoping that after the course of this conversation, I'll be I'll be there. So where I'd like to start is for all the listeners that aren't already kind of in the in the libertarian uh, circle, argumentation ethics is an attempt to ground libertarian ideas in a kind of inescapable rationalist framework, that there are these yes. ethical principles that you cannot escape, just kind of like the a principle of the law of logic, that you know you can't argue that you cannot argue, or you can't argue that existence doesn't exist. There are just certain inescapable things that you have to acknowledge if you're going to be rational. And then supposedly, the argument goes, um, there are also inescapable ethical truths that if you discover what they are, they lead you to kind of um, libertarian conclusions. Is that a fair yeah. kind of summarization of the approach? Yeah, perfectly right. Perfectly good. Okay, so let's start with that, um, just working through the basics. What then is this, the, the inescapable argument that leads us to some kind of ethical rationalist um, framework? All right. So let me give a little background first, which is, that this is a theory that was pioneered by Hans Hermann Hoppe, and actually he would be your best guest on this, right? I mean, he is the guy that originated this theory in the in the mid '80s. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I, I'm the probably next to him, I'm the one who's written the most about it. And he, mm-hmm. uh, um, and I've also written a, a kind of a complementary theory of, of rights, which I came up on my own, kind of inspired by his, called a stopple. Um, and I don't know if we'll get into that or not, but. Um, so before you start talking about the best proof of rights or libertarian principles, mm-hmm. I think it's be- we need to have an idea of what we're what what the whole uh, subject matter is, like what okay. we're tr- what is it we're interested in. So first, I h- think it helps to clarify basically what we conceive of as libertarian principles. What what are they mm. before we say that, and then how they're justified, okay. um, and what it means to justify, and what other approaches have been. So if you want to do it that way, I can just kind of lay out a few things, and you can. Yes, that's interrupt great. You if you need to. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> the way I conceive of libertarianism in its most sort of distilled form is uh, it is a po- you can call it a political ethic. You could even call it a meta ethic because it's really not a set of rules about how we should personally live, but it's a set of rules about what the law should be. Okay. Okay. So, and this is what uh, Douglas uh, Rasmussen and J- Douglas De- J. Denoyle, that's how they characterize. Rights to in the book Liberty and Nature. They're two, two sort of neo Randian libertarian philosophers. Um, anyway, you don't have to view rights that way. That's how I view them. But it, mm. the non aggression principle, I believe, is core to what we believe, but I think it's just a shorthand version of what we believe in. It's really not an explanation of it, it's just a shorthand. And what it really means is this um, in the case of your body, In the case of any scarce resource, there could be possibly conflict between human actors, Mm -hmm. and property rules uh, are uh, arrived at in society as a means of identifying who is the one person that has the right to control that resource so that conflict can be avoided in the use of those resources. Okay. Okay. Now, now that's basically what any legal system is, even even a socialist legal system, specifies owners of resources – Okay. Whether it's whether it's human bodies in the case of slavery or someone in prison, um, or whether it's other resources, you know, like land or cars or, or, or food, things like that. So the libertarian view is that we assign those resources in accordance with basically the the, the simple principles of contract and first ownership, which is sort of a Lockean principle. So if something is unowned, the first person to start using it is the owner. Until okay. he transfers it voluntarily to someone else, which is what contract is. So with a couple of supplementary rules, right? Like if you hurt someone and you owe them restitution, then they can take some of your property in that case. Okay. But generally speaking, uh, you can find out who the owner of a resource is by asking who has it now, who had it first, and was there a contract? Hmm. So those simple principles 
give uh, give rise to the, what we call the non-aggression principle. I think we call the non-aggression principle because in the case of someone's body, uh, if you attack someone, that's what the, the term aggression usually means, like attacking – physically attacking someone else's body. That's held to be a violation of their property right in their body. Okay. And then by extension, we would say something similar happens if you use uh, another piece of property they own without their permission. Okay, that's trespass, but we lump it in with the concept of aggression as a type of shorthand. Okay. Okay. So basically, you get from this the standard libertarian rules. This, there, there's a, if you notice, there's a type of symmetry and a type of reciprocity in these rules, in that uh, you are entitled to do to someone only what they did to you, because. If someone is not violating my property rights, I'm not entitled to violate their property rights. Okay. So if someone is publishing pornography or smoking marijuana, they're not uh, invading my property rights, mm -hmm. and so I'm not entitled to use force against them, which means any law against those activities would be unjust. I can insult them. I can berate them because I'm not violating their property rights either, so there's a symmetry. Okay. But if someone attacks me physically, they have used force against me. And now I'm entitled to use of force against them defensively or even after the fact for rest, restitution or mm -hmm. e even for retribution, some would argue. Okay, So you see, again, there's a symmetry there, mm -hmm. and I think this is what libertarians like. That's why we always have this sort of scalpel. Like every time a, a, a normie, we call them, right, a normal person proposes a <laughs> law, <coughs> you know, let's, let's just tax people or let's just ban this practice. We say, well, look, you're using force against them. Did they use force? themselves first? Did they initiate force? And if they didn't, there's an asymmetry there, and that's why we say that law is unjust. Okay, this this do, smacks do, me do as – Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, this, this strikes me as kind of a Kantian principle, that, that there's a kind of universal aspect to this um, way of conceiving about um, political ethic. Is that fair? I Well, I do, it may be compatible with Kantianism, but all I'm doing right now is trying to sort of Observe what libertarians say, mm. and and kind of condense their principles into more of a uh, uh, just to figure out what their principles are and to, and to restate them in a in a concise fashion. Okay. So I'm just trying to restate what they believe, not to justify it yet. Okay. I think you have to understand what they are before you start talking about what it means to justify. I right. mean, so from your perspective, would you say that is roughly a summary of what the core of the principles are that most libertarians believe in? I would say, from my experience, that encompasses at least half of um, the kind of arguments that I encounter when talking with libertarians, is it comes back to that notion of reciprocity, almost kind of getting at a golden rule mentality, you know, do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, except kind of as a basis for a legal system, you know, don't, don't hit people, don't take their stuff, and they'll do the same to you. I do think there's a another group of people that approach it just from purely kind of consequentialist um, ends, and they say, well, the only reason we're into this libertarianism stuff is because it results in human flourishing, something like that. And I, I find maybe, yes. maybe a, a third or so, maybe a little bit more than that, take that approach. Yes, yes. Okay, well, okay. Let, but again, I think you're talking about justifications more than the principles that they believe. I think and, – and personally, I don't really – I'm not really persuaded that there's a, there's a strong uh, gulf between consequentialism and a, sort of a principled or deontological approach. I think okay. they're they're just different ways of looking at the same world. So I I'm not surprised that they're the same. But anyway, the point is, uh, the typical libertarian, whatever his even if he's uh, I don't know what the word would be, an atheist or agnostic in terms of he has no grounds for his principles whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But he believes in the libertarian principles. He yeah. will believe – you will hear libertarians, whether they're consequentialists or not, they will routinely say uh, you, may not, you may not initiate force. Just right. by saying the words and you may not initiate force, there's a – you're recognizing implicitly a symmetry there, right? You can yeah. only use force in response to force. Yeah. So you can use force in response to force, but if someone's not using force against you, you can only you, you can only do other things that don't re result in force. So that symmetry is just present in the libertarian idea. I, I'm not really saying it's a, the justification is there. It, this is just what libertarians do believe. Yes, yeah. Now, I think if we take it from that standpoint, that is that is pretty much ubiquitous. That I think every libertarian would agree with that that notion. Yes, and and then you have to unpack what it means to say for, initiate force because if I walk across your lawn at two thirty in the morning when you're sleeping. 
it's not really the same as aggression like me punching you in the head. It's it, We only call it aggression or force, uh, I think, by analogy because it's a trespass. It's a use of pro- – the general case is this. It's a use of someone else's resource without their permission. Mm-hmm. That is whoever owns the resource, including human bodies, if someone else invades the physical borders of that property or uses it without their permission – that is what is trespass, or that is what is aggression okay. in a generalized sense. So this is just what libertarians believe. Um, now, I don't know if you take your average liberal or your average conservative or fascist or egalitarian or environmentalist, and if you ask them, state what you believe, they could state it. And then if you said, now provide a justification. I don't know if everyone walking around <laughs> the earth is walking around with their set of beliefs in their back pocket and their set of justifications than their other – back pocket. A right. lot of people don't have justifications or they're not clear ones. Um, and yes, some libertarians don't don't really have a justification. It's just they think it comes out of their Christian faith or they they take it on faith or they just have a personal preference. Yes, and I think the way that you stated that earlier, probably most people in general, not just libertarians, would agree with this intuitive notion of yeah, okay, I shouldn't I shouldn't aggress on other people. I think that's not maybe not maybe not everybody, but I think a whole lot of people even if they don't consider themselves libertarians would agree to that principle at least. Yeah, and I think that actually the the justificationist pro- project is not necessarily one that we even have to do. Mm. Uh, some people are interested in it, and the reason is because w- one thing we libertarians can do is simply identify the fact that most fellow humans that live in society do believe in our core notions, okay? However vaguely and however um, However, inconsistently, they do believe that basic idea: you shouldn't hurt other people. Right. And so, uh, the entire libertarian project, in my view, can be thought of as simply adding a little bit of economic literacy <laughs> to the to the mixture um, and consistency. Right. Okay. okay. And in fact, I, when you said most libertarians would agree with the, the principles I spe- specified, it, I, I actually think that's not quite true because non-anarchists, that is, minarchists, don't quite believe that. So. You could say that the the principled, consistent libertarian believes that aggression is never justified. It is impossible I, to justify. I think where the where the split comes is when is when it's treated as an absolute versus a principle. I think pretty much everybody um, would agree that that's like the non-aggression principle is a good rule of thumb. I think where you get very strong disagreement is if that's kind of an absolute thing or if that's or, or yeah, if it's a rule of thumb. Well, right. It was what like Robert knows it called side constraints. So rights are yeah. side constraints on what you can do. That they just cannot be violated. No, well, I wouldn't say they cannot be violated, but they may not be violated, right? Right. But um, so I would say, yeah. So when you talk about it as a rule of thumb, that's just a way of <laughs> sort of uh, uh, putting a, a, a nice shiny gloss on what you're really saying, which is I'm against aggression most of the time. <laughs> Or some of the time. So, and, and, and you'll see conservatives and even liberals sometimes will explicitly say something like this. They'll yeah. say, well, we agree with you libertarians that liberty is an important value. We just don't fetishize it. Right. Now, what they, what they mean by that is like the Supreme Court doing some balancing test of competing interests. Um, you know, They want to take liberty into account, but it's just one of many values, right. which is just a pretty way of saying – in some cases, we're willing to condone or commit or authorize the use of aggression against you if we don't agree yeah. with you. Like, right. I'm going to bash you in the head in the end. So in the end, even a minarchist ultimately is like this. They'll say, look, I'm with you 99% of the way. I agree that most aggression is wrong, but we still need to tax people and blah, blah, blah for a minimal state or whatever. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but that is that is actually aggression. Yes, but I think they would probably say then – then I am I am not an absolutist on the principle that that I'm with well, you ninety nine percent. It's not they would say it's probably well, not a criticism of my ideas just because I give these little these little no, but it, but, what, what, but but when they say they're not an absolutist, what they mean is they're not against aggression. Hmm. Okay, they don't have a principled uh, opposition to aggression. They think that in some cases it is permissible to initiate the use of force against innocent people. That is what they're saying. Now the Randians have this complicated dodge, right? They'll They'll get into context and all this kind of crap, and they'll say that, well, properly understood in context, we need a government as the rational framework for our rights, and therefore it's not really aggression, even though it is. I mean, so you know, 
Actually, the Randians, I think, have a lot of good points, but their two main failings are on intellectual property, which is their worst, and on anarchy, which I think they're quasi-anarchists. They just don't realize it. If you read the end of Atlas Shrugged, it's basically anarchists. Uh, so Rand was really wrong on anarchy and on IP. Uh, other than that, a lot of her stuff, I think, is good. But Well, so anyway, let me ask so, you. So, so on that yeah. point, um, mm -hmm. if I were to say something like, as a general rule, you know, I don't support aggression against people that aren't being violent. But I'll make some exceptions. So I could say something yes. like, you know, I don't think you should put your hands on other people when they don't give you permission to do that. But if yes. somebody's running out in the street, I might, I might actually do that. And yes. I, so I would give an exception. Are you saying that that is that demonstrates that I support violence, or that that's a reasonable exception to make? Because I think most people kind of view it like that. Yeah, I don't. I think that's wrong. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Um, okay. First of all, I don't think that. No, I don't think there are any exceptions. Okay. If, if, if there's an exception, then there's one of two things going on. And remember, that's one reason I earlier said I think rights are metanormative principles or they're, princip they're not principles that directly govern individual behavior. Mm -hmm. This is a, a brief aside, um, but most people, if you press them and if you go through this, I think most people, most libertarians would – most normal people – Call, uh, treat ethics and political ethics as sort of the same sets. Mm -hmm. So if they see something that they believe is wrong, like racial discrimination, then why not have a law against it, mm -hmm. right? Or if they think it's wrong to abuse your body with drugs, why not have a law against it? So they right. see these sets as the same. Most libertarians, if you ask them, they would see the, the, the set of political ethics as a proper subset of ethics. Mm -hmm. So that is everything that's a rights violation is immoral, but not everything that's immoral can be made illegal, right? Okay. Now, most people don't ever get to the point of trying to formalize it like that, but I think if you press them, they would agree with that. So you think I, that with, with the case of the, the pulling the guy from the street, that that would be a, a circumstance of immorality but not illegality no. or vice versa? No. No, no, so hold on. So I'm getting okay. there because okay. I actually disagree with this subset set distinction. I think that the sets are overlapping sets okay. because, again, because I think the principle of libertarianism, while they can inform your personal ethics, they're not the same as. Okay, So mm. just because we say as a community of people that it's a rights violation to do X doesn't mean that it's immoral for you to do X. You, For example, hmm. for, the, for the exact same reason that it's – it's not always moral to to be within your rights. Uh, if I insult my grandmother, or if I don't let a starving neighbor come onto my prop, or you know, a neighbor whose kid has been wounded in a car wreck, I just won't let them come onto my into my house for ten minutes to call an ambulance. Mm -hmm. I can do that and be within my rights. If I see a stranger drowning in a pond, I don't have a positive legal obligation to rescue them unless I push them in. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but I might be totally immoral in refusing to help them even though I'm not violating their rights. And by the, by, by, by the same token, it could be that it is not immoral in some cases to violate rights. Um, the case of a friend about to commit suicide uh -huh. and you use force to prevent them, although uh, there's a different argument that that's not even an exception that needs a justification. Um, so let's give a couple of cases. The the the, uh, the, the the grabbing the kid. Right. I don't even think that's a violation of. I don't think. See, you said violence earlier. Of course, libertarians are not against violence. We're against the initiation of violence, right? Okay. Right. And that's again just a compact way of saying you can't use someone's property without their consent. Now, a minor is considered to be not fully uh, compos mentis, right? So he has guardians that make decisions for him and on mm. his behalf. And those guardians don't have to be only his lineal parents. They can be others in the community that, that we assume the parents would consent to them doing some things in emergency situations. So okay. I think that it, I think that in the case of saving the child, the, the child is consenting to it because his guardians are, would, of course, implicitly grant consent to that kind of action. OK, what if Just it's somebody like, that's like an adult yeah, that's on his smartphone, you know, because when we come around here, this is happening. I've noticed on the, on the sidewalks, people bump into you when they're looking down at their smartphone. What if somebody is yeah. on their, an adult's on their smartphone and you, the bus is coming and you go, hey, buddy, and you grab them? I think in a case like that, um, it's, it's, it's such an emergency situation. We don't have time to have a conversation with someone and find out whether they really want to commit suicide or whether they – uh, whether they would would consent to uh, mm -hmm. to being briefly jostled to save their life. So all you can do in the split second is try to use the crude language that we have, which is social conventions, right? Because this is all a matter of 
when we talk about consent, consent is a cumin. It has to be communicated by a public language, but language need not only be words, right? You can have a, mm-hmm. you could have two people that don't even speak the same language get along with each other. So there's always a background assumption of norms, customs, and uh, things like that that inform language. So I think when you see someone, a regular business in or the cell phone, about to walk into the face of a bus that's coming, and he's he's obviously distracted. The assumption is that he's in, like implicitly communicating by his existence in a society like that, right? Without walking around with a sign saying, "Hey, if you see me about to die, don't <laughs> rescue me." That so he's not changing the the default presumption of what communication is, right? So basically, my point is, most people would assume that the guy would consent to being rescued. Okay. Um, so I think that's the best solution, and I can't imagine a jury punishing the guy, and you, and you can't even imagine a victim wanting to go after his rescuer. In the rare case when it was, he would probably be himself be laughed out of court or ignored or looked at as a, you know, a troublemaker or something like that. And, and but even if we say it's a it's an act of aggression to rescue your friend mm-hmm. committing who wants to commit suicide because you think he'll see reason in the light of day, right? Or rescuing this businessman about to walk into the face of a Apache helicopter or whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, even in that case, what you could say is. The rescuer is willing to take the risk of some slight legal liability mm-hmm. um, in order to do a good deed for, for someone else, and so he just hopes for forgiveness. Okay. And you know th- that's one way to approach that that issue. As well. Okay, so let me ask you just on that question, then we'll get to the the argumentation, ethics, justification part. Yeah, um, justification. So, would you say that if we're going to be really strict in our analysis of rights that in the case of pulling the guy um, you know out of the street so he doesn't get hit by the bus technically speaking that would be a rights violation but it wouldn't be something that's immoral and it would be under the assumption that the, the person would have permitted it but if we're going to be technical it still is a rights violation no if the assumption is he would have permitted it and if that assumption is correct then it's not a rights violation because it's consented to so so it's not a it's not a rights violation based on the assumption of consent, because so, uh, that seems like a dubious. If I could say, okay. "Oh, I thought you consented to take my television," or if I, if I, I thought you considered to me take, taking your television, you know. Well, I think opinions among libertarians would da- vary on that. Okay, you, you okay. could look. You could say there's maybe three distinct views there. I mean, I have my own view. I lean a certain way. And by the way, I think these we can we can from our armchair lay out different. Um, rules, but we're not doing this completely in a vacuum. We've sort of seen these things play out through history, so we sort of have a – we see how society would tend to solve these things, mm-hmm. and I think that's probably what would happen in, in, a, few, in a pure private law society. Um, so in other words, I think that even if we have different arguments right now, you know, one or two of them is going to be settled on over time, and then you're walking to this community, and you know what the background expectations are in this respect. Okay, so, in so any is, case, I think that the, the diff- so you could argue you could view it like you did. You could say that, um, you could say that as the rescuer, I'm assuming the guy will retroactively say he consented, and right. everything will be fine. There's like a 99.9 percent chance. So I'm taking a very small risk that I am violating. Like in other words, it's, it's epistemologically or epist- epistemically unknowable whether I'm violating his rights. I can't know until after the fact. I see. But I'm going to take the chance. That's one way of looking at it, and I think in some cases that is what is happening. I think in the case you mentioned, I I personally would would just say, look, the guy by his own action is putting his fellow neighbors into a position where they have no choice but to make a split second decision, and it's if anyone, it's his fault for putting them in that in that area of uncertainty. Okay, so then we have to say, well, then what was communicated? If anything was communicated, um, I, I would say that. There is actual consent, and even if the guy later says, "Look, I don't want to ever be rescued. I'm I'm a I'm a one percent minority outlier or a one out of a million outlier," um, I think we say, "Well, you're just wrong. You did consent. If you don't want to consent, you need to have some kind of special clothing that you know." That, <laughs> Do not resuscitate you know, type idea. You, you can't expect everyone in society. And by the way, this all also. We never specify whether the property is public or private when we talk about these things. It's sort of like we imagine this sort of. <laughs> This ghostly uh, 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 realm of of, uh, of non vaguely specified walking ground that you know there's mist everywhere and no one owns okay. it. You're just happy to bump into it. But in reality, you're always, especially in a libertarian society, you're always 
in a private property setting. So either you're on his property or he's on your property or you're on the shopping mall's property. And okay. there are already some rules laid down for this kind of behavior, if only implicit rules. So, so if, really the resort might be the, the rules of the property owner. So if we were to if we were to take that line of reasoning, though, couldn't you see in a line of argument that said, um, you know, oh, I – you know, groped you inappropriately because I assumed that you were consenting based on the, you know, your behavior and something like that. Doesn't that kind of, doesn't that kind of open up the door to all kinds of claims of yeah, assuming yeah, it consent? It does, but I think that's why the, the law is the is the sort of the art of actually making concrete decisions about concrete cases, right? Mm -hmm. By applying rules to them, and you have to take into account the dangers of having just. Um, a rule that could lead to a slippery slope. So, you know, for example, uh, in the common law, and I think most libertarians would agree that you don't have to respond to, you don't have to wait for someone to physically attack you before you respond. Mm -hmm. If someone is in, in a context where they've indicated they want to shoot you and they, they raise their weapon and they cock the trigger and they're, it looks like they're about to pull the trigger and they mm -hmm. have every intention of doing so as far as you can tell, uh, then you don't have to wait for the bullet to start heading your way. You can mm -hmm. you can raise your gun and shoot them first. That's preemptive, right? Preemptive force. But the common law has drawn a very set, a very strict set of criteria around when you can exercise. It has to be an immediate, direct force. Something that the, the reasonable everyday man would interpret that way, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Like okay. if the guy's a raving lunatic or he's got a red tip on a plastic pistol where you should have known, <laughs> then then you wouldn't be. So these are – they do require judgment um, of the jury or the community or the judge, and over time, these standards do develop, and people start adjusting their behavior to be guided by them. So in those circumstances, it doesn't seem like when it's it's clear-cut, it seems like the rule is something that emerges or it's something you know, where we're talking about a reasonable man. That – I think that's correct, but it lacks the kind of um, – uh, argumentative power of saying yep. this is the black and white rule it does so if that's true in those circumstances why would couldn't somebody just say well that's true of all law all law is all property rights and rules are just kind of communally agreed to well that's a let's that's a whole different issue getting into the social contract and those kinds of issues mm -hmm. um and I, um I, w I would do two things here number one i would say well, Randy Barnett in his book The Structure of Liberty, he talks about this. He's an anarchist uh, libertarian scholar, and what he tries to do is, is say that he distinguishes between abstract rules and uh, legal precepts. Now, abstract rules are these things we would come at come at come up with from our armchair. Okay. Or at least we would sort of refine them deductively after seeing inductively many cases over the over centuries and, and we, we sort of, you know, get rid of the inconsistencies and formalize and codify it. But when you have to apply them to particular cases, that's more of a concrete case, and you have to have judges and all these people take the facts into account. But the point is, compare this to compare this to any other system. I mean, any system, whether it's socialist or welfare statist or democratic, any type of political legal system is going to have to deal with borderline cases, continuum issues, right. and just because those exist in life and just because libertarianism doesn't have a deductive answer you can answer always from your armchair doesn't mean it's an inferior theory because mm -hmm. every theory has these issues. You, you could have a dictator, a fuhrer, just decide everything. It would be totally black and white. Just come to him and he'll give the answer. <laughs> a wins, B wins, C wins, D wins. That's it. I mean you would know who the owner is and who the winner is. It wouldn't it would be bright, bright line, we would call it, but it wouldn't be just, <laughs> or wouldn't you have any, any reason to think it's just? Okay, so this is a perfect segue into part two, talking about justification. So we have the the general intuition about non-aggression and respecting other people's property, and now we want to seek the justification through argumentation ethics. So how make that transition for me? How do we? Get so yeah, to, so let's yeah. talk. So let's talk about like like we said earlier. Maybe not everyone has a justification, or, or it's only vague. Or I would say the prevailing view among most people is that it's either common sense or it's pragmatic, mm -hmm. right? Or it's based upon common sense morals or even religious morals. Basically, the natural law way of thinking versus the 
pragmatic or utilitarian or consequentialist way of thinking, right? Mm-hmm. So I would say that in the first – I would say libertarianism started in the mid-50s, right, with Ayn Rand and Leonard Reed and Rothbard and these guys and the modern libertarian movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the, for the first 30 or so years of the movement, maybe first 30 or 40, probably the prevailing ethos would have been the Randian one, which is more of a natural law one, right, which is the idea that um, there are certain natural principles – of ethics or morality in the universe, and this is whether you're an atheist or not, by the way. And the non-atheists maybe have an easier time of that because they, they think that the, you know, God basically sets up what's right and wrong. And it's sort right. of somehow in the structure of reality. Um, but uh, the, the more secular natural law types think it's just inherent in reality or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and their argument is something like, look, humans have a nature the way by the way we're organized and our, our social nature with each other. Uh, the laws of economics; these all combine to say that you know you just shouldn't you shouldn't do basic things. And like I said, libertarianism just makes those more consistent and applies a little economic logic to it. Um, and you'll even hear the term like uh, you know the, the basic laws of nature are engraved on your heart. Mm-hmm. Th- this line is used sometimes. Um, you know, there's a doctrine of the law that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Mm-hmm. Which in today's legal system is a travesty because there are so many laws, no one knows what these fake laws are. Right. So ignorance of the law should be an excuse. But in a natural law system where the only thing that's illegal is you know rape, murder, crime. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, theft. Then it's okay to hold someone liable for those actions, even if they claim they didn't know, because we say everyone knows this. It's written on your heart, man. Everyone knows that you shouldn't <laughs> hurt other people. Um, right. So that's one sort of argument. I don't really know what they're drawing on there. Are they saying God put that in your heart or it's just common sense? So they don't, but this more strict version of natural law says that because of our nature, we shouldn't do certain things, right? Certain things are conducive to your flourishing, like Mm -hmm. you were getting at earlier. The problem with this argument from the Hoppian point of view and the Kantian point of view and the Humean point of view, actually, I'm not sure about Kant, but Hume for sure. Is the is ought gap, right? So, Mm -hmm. is the idea that you cannot get an ought or a normative or a moral statement just from a mere statement of facts. You have to somewhere insert an ought, right? Right? So, you can't say because man is what he is, therefore he should do X, right? That that's and I agree with that, brother. I think the is ought gap is logically unbridgeable. Mm -hmm. I I do agree with Hoppe on this. Now, some of the more sophisticated Randians like Roderick Long. They try to get around this by what they call an assertoric – I don't know if you've heard of this – assertoric hypothetical. They say, no, it's not an if-then. It's a since-then. So it's like since we all agree with the following principles, therefore, which I think is perfectly valid. Hmm. Most people do believe in certain core principles. You could say since you and I both agree that we want humans to flourish, since you and I both agree um, that you shouldn't hurt people without a good reason. Therefore, you know, then you conclude – you go on mm-hmm. with your libertarian and your economic reasoning. Yeah. It would be very similar to going to a Star Trek convention, and, and you know, uh, y- y- it wouldn't make sense for two people at a Star Trek convention to argue that people shouldn't like Star Trek because they are – they're both fans already. Right. Right? So you say, look, since you and I are both Star Trek fans, I think that this movie is better than the other one or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But – if you're talking to a non-Star Trek fan, they'd say, I don't like movies at all. I don't like Star Trek, so I don't think either one's better. We don't have to decide. Right. But if you're talking the same fundamental language, which I've, which I've called um, something called grund norms after Hans Kelsen. The grund norms are like sort of core basic ethical or legal principles. It's analogous to the a priori type or basic truths that I think you've talked about as well, You know, just the kind of core logical – Truths that we can identify about reality and build yep. up from there. They're sort of like uh, uh, fundamental, fundamental elemental principles. In any case, the problem with the Aristotelian approach, I believe, is that you have to introduce an ought somewhere. And then is that just arbitrary? Is that just subjective preference? Whatever. So Hop, the argumentation ethic approach is a different one. Um, and the con- let's talk about consequentialism. So consequentialism is just the idea that we ought to adopt rules that – well, utilitarianism is a, is a subset of consequentialism, I believe, right? And that says you should adopt a rule that benefits the – does the greatest good for the greatest number. Right. And I think 
I don't think we need to elaborate the problems with that, like just from Austrian economics, right? The problem that you can't quantify uh, uh, preference or utility, sorry, and you can't intersubjectively compare it. And anyway, the statement is just arbitrary. You're just stating that this is preference. I mean, let's say it would help a thousand people to give them a million dollars each by robbing Bill Gates of it. That might be true, but why is it right to rob from Bill Gates? See, it still doesn't answer that question. So right. it, it sort of it makes it makes it more it makes it a, a hidden moral leap. Okay, now now I think we're we're ready to talk about argumentation things <laughs> if you want. Yes. So what Hoppe did? So Hoppe Hoppe, do um, you want a little background on on Hoppe, where he came from, and how he arrived at his ideas? Um, well, I think we should just go straight into the argument. Given okay. I have still got lots of good questions for you, so. Okay. All right. So Hoppe's argument is this. The only way to justify uh, propositional truths, right, claims about the universe that are true is in argumentation. And he believes that there's what we call an a priori argumentation. He draws upon Jürgen Habermas, who's a famous socialistic German philosopher. It was his mm-hmm. PhD teacher, actually, and Carl, Carl Otto Appel, Appel, who was a colleague of, of uh, Habermas's. Um, and this this is called the a priori of argumentation or discourse, and the idea is that uh, you could never deny that to be true. You can never deny that all truth claims have to be settled in the course of some kind of discourse or argumentation because you'd be engaged in a discourse or argumentation in the mm. attempt to say that it's not necessary to do so. Okay. So it's 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 it, you can see how it's similar to in structure to some of like the Misesian and even Randian type um, a priori type. Arguments and proofs, right? Like man acts. You can't deny that man acts because that's an action, etc. Right, right, right. So their basic idea is that um, anything that we want to decide upon is true. Anything that's a contestable proposition or claim has to be decided in the course of an argumentation. Okay. Now Hoppe's sort of unique spin on it, after being uh, made aware of kind of Mises's views on economics and the nature of scarcity in the world, and Rothbard's views on libertarianism. Uh, was that you could you could fashion this type of argument into a defense of libertarian principles? Okay? Mm, okay, and what he does is he says, so every you can only know what's true or not in the course of an argumentation. Now, if it's a dis- if it's a dis- if it's a disagreement over what a factual matter is, right, like a scientific issue, that's called a disagreement. And again, we have to have discussion and discourse to figure that out. Mm-hmm. But in the case of physical conflict among people, which again is what rights exist for, to solve the problem of conflict and the use of scarce resources. In the place in the pace of con- in the in the in the in the situation where there's conflict, argumentation is designed to determine how to resolve the conflict. That's what that's what it is. So okay. whenever we talk about any given law or possible right, that discussion itself has to be done in the course of an argumentation. Okay. So his his basic insight is this: argumentation is not just some free floating affair; it is a practical affair in the real world. And it and argumentation itself is not uh, value free or norm free because it has some it has some presupposed norms built into the very structure of argumentation because okay. of its nature. Because so argumentation is think of it this way in terms of logical subsets. Um, Argumentation is a type of speech act, and a speech act is a type of action. So it's all in that framework. So you have action, and one subset of action is speech acts. Like not all actions are speech acts, and not all actions are um, – uh, some, some actions are things other than speech acts. You know, if I go spear fishing, I'm not speaking. Right. And if I if I – and then one type of action is speaking, but not all speaking is arguing. You know, If I'm just having a conversation with you or if I'm – uh, you know, reciting the lines for a movie play or something. I'm not engaging in argumentation. We're right. not trying to have a discussion about a contested issue where we're trying to figure out what the truth of the matter is. Right. So a proper subset of speech acts would be argumentation, and that's the the one that always has to happen whenever we have a disagreement about what the right or the wrong thing to do is. Okay. So the kind of general framework is that whatever the normative or the ethical presuppositions of argumentation. Per se, as an activity are, then any norm you're trying to justify would have to be compatible with that. So that's sort of the core initial insight he has that okay. if there are some normative presuppositions of argumentation, 
You could never argue for something that contradicts that. Right. Just like you could never argue with a fellow Star Trek fan that people shouldn't be Star Trek fans, in, in a <laughs> sense. Because they both suppose that they love Star Trek, right? Okay, so what are some of those norms that are presupposed with argumentation? Okay, that's why you have to say, well, then what is argumentation? It's a practical thing where the arguers are both trying to find the truth, right? That's number one. Their, their, their goal is honesty and truth, and therefore consistency and logical consistency. But also, there, you have to draw a distinction between coercing someone and free choice. So, the, so one presupposition is that each person is not coercing the other to accept their claim. I'm not saying I think it's A, you think it's B, but if you don't agree with me, I'm going to bash you over the head with a sledgehammer at the end because then I'll just, I'll just confess and say you're right to avoid – but then we're not engaged in argumentation. It's just, it's just bullying or coercion. So one presupposition is basically peacefulness. The participants are agree, agreeing to effectively respect the bodily integrity of the other. They are not coercing them. Okay. So, um, what about – so let me stop you there. What about if they're – talking what about if they're arguing about uh, what happens at the end of their argument so if they're arguing saying you know once we stop once we stop respecting each other's rights or you know if if we if you lose mm -hmm. this argument i'm going to take your money or if uh, i lose this argument you take my money well first of all that's what every argument every argument is about things outside the argument so in other words we're living in society peacefully uh, or not whether it's peacefully or not we're living together in some kind of community and society right and then a dispute arises I mean, we're going about our business non-argumentatively. We're not engaging argumentation all the time. Most of us. You know, we're making – well, <laughs> even us are not, right? I know it's funny, but, um, but the point is the, the entire reason that you engage in a normative argumentation is to settle something that will be true after the argumentation is over. Okay. So you get the argument. You have a conclusion. You are trying to come up with a principle that would apply outside of the field of argumentation. So that's one criticism of this approach that – Bob Murphy and Gene Callahan and others have made. They say, well, it's only true during the argumentation. It's like – and as Hoppe points out in his recent talk on this, if that were true, well, then so is your criticism. In other words, your criticism of my argument is only true while you're making the criticism. And as soon as you're done talking, we go back to the point – we go back to the status quo where my argument was right. I, I mean of, whenever we have a discussion, we're always trying to uh, come up with rules. And okay. facts that apply outside there. You know, if I, if you and I want to discuss whether the moon is made of cheese or not, we're not trying to figure out whether the moon is made of cheese for the, for the duration of our argument. We're trying okay. to find out whether it's really made of cheese. Okay, so let me, um, let me rephrase that, and if I do it incorrectly, then correct, then uh, correct my okay. error. So, to the extent that one is engaged in true argumentation, you might say. It is by yes. definition something that is inescapably peaceful. Now, that yes. doesn't mean you're restricted from knocking the other person on the head. It just means that by definition, if you're doing that, you have, you're not arguing. Yes, and it means you can't, and it also, then it means you can't justify it. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you can't justify doing it. So that's why you have to distinguish okay. in a binary way whether you know, a right – establishing that there's a right doesn't mean it's going to be respected. It just means it can't the, – the, the action that violates the right can't be justified. So if I'm a person and I want to use your body or your property without your, without your express, express consent right, against your, against your oppositional claims, I've got two choices. I can either just do it anyway. right? Mm -hmm. I can I – I, I give up the attempt to reason. Um, or I can justify it, but to okay. justify it, I have to give I do, be able to give reasons in an argumentation. Um, now, from the point of view of the other person, you you view people in two categories: either like animals, or what Hoppe calls technical problems, or as rational people. If they're rational people, they're willing to consider evidence and arguments, right, and reason, and respect your right to bodily integrity during the course of an argument, at least. Okay. Um, so you have to treat – so just because there are some people that are criminals out there in a sense doesn't, doesn't mean uh, argumentation ethics is wrong. It just means that it is possible to violate a right. These are not physical causal laws that can't be violated like gravity. They are normative laws that tell you what action is justified. It doesn't mean that action can't occur. Okay. Um, but, but we've missed a second. So l let me just finish yes. real quickly and then we can go. So uh, you can see how 
this this um, rendition of the argumentation ethics approach so far, you can see how bodily rights come out of that, right? Okay. So basically, you have to respect each other's bodily integrity, which implies that you both are recognizing your self ownership and the other person's self ownership, which is one of the core libertarian principles. Okay. But the other the other part of libertarianism is also the right of libertarians to own uh, things outside their body, private property, resources that they appropriate. Uh, and then Hoppe's argument goes on to extend it to that case where he points out that argumentation – it's not just your bodies. You, this is a practical affair in the real world. Uh, you had to actually get there. You have to survive. That requires resources. You have to be standing somewhere when you make your argument. right? So there's all these uses of resources that are also presupposed in the course of argumentation, and you know, 95 percent of the time the argument is about one of those resources. So okay. the dispute is about you know, who gets to control this bank of the river, who gets to control this field, uh, who gets to control that plow that I made and that you took from me, things like that. Um, so when two people enter into a, dis a discourse about that, they are both presupposing, number one, their self-ownership, which implies certain rules. right? It implies this sort of first-come rule, first-come, first-serve rule. In other words, one inherent aspect of the entire notion of property rights is the idea that a latecomer has to have inferior rights to an earlier comer. If you think about it… The very search, the very nature of property has to have this latecomer rule embedded in it because if latecomers don't have worse claims, that, that and by that by latecomer I mean someone currently is recognized as the owner or the possessor of something. A latecomer is someone who comes on the scene after and claims superior rights to the resource. Okay. If latecomers did not have a worse claim, you could not have property rights at all. Because it would just be a world of might makes right, and you would, okay. you would again be back to the pre-law, pre-right situation. So the latecomer rule has to be embedded in any property ethic. Whoever the owner is has a better claim than someone who comes later and just says, okay. I want it because, of, because I prefer to have it. Um, and so therefore, when you have two people asking to be assigned the ownership rights of a resource, they're recognizing the principle of ownership, which recognizes the principle of – that earlier users have a better claim than latecomers, and then the dispute comes a factual matter about well, then who, which one was the latecomer in this particular case? And whoever the evidence indicates had a better claim would be recognized as the owner. Okay. Okay. So. So that that is how the I think that is sort of the essence of the argumentation ethics approach. Now, the the point you brought up about well, what after the argumentation ends? Those are sort of later criticisms that came and that have been dealt with, uh, sort of in a, like a response reply type. Fashion, but the basic core of the argument is that um, is that all normative claims have to be settled in an argument, and argumentation itself is a peaceful, cooperative activity in which bodily integrity or self ownership and the right to control resources, which are necessary for the argumentation even to have happened, are presupposed, and therefore any ethic that you propose during an argument. That is contrary to these things could never be justified. There's a practical or performative contradiction, Hoppe would say. Okay. And therefore, if you advocate a socialistic ethic, then you're advocating something that's incompatible with the presuppositions of your argument, and it's just a, a contradiction. And therefore, no socialistic ethic could ever be advocated or could ever be justified. Beautiful. Okay. So that is a, I think that's a great summarization. Now, I want to ask you. Some mm -hmm. of my um, skeptical mm -hmm. problems with this, mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm ready to be convinced because I love the conclusions. I love mm -hmm. that uh, it's rationalist, which is I'm very disposed towards that type of reasoning. Um, but here's one of the the areas that I I don't see the connection. Okay, mm -hmm. so I am totally on board that in the process of arguing. You are inescapably in control of your lungs, your your, your vocal cords. You're, you're demonstrating some kind of control over yourself when you are. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How does that get you though to 
the concept of legitimate ownership. So I, so if I were to say something like, it is true that in the process of arguing, you must have control over your vocal cords, but that doesn't mean there's any such thing as property. There's no such thing as like a le like legitimate property ownership or right. anything like that. Well, so here, here's where I think we have to we have to really grapple with the distinction between uh, causal laws or the you know the factual world and normative things. When we establish a normative rule, we, it's not like a law of physics where you can't violate it. Right. What are we really asking? So what does ownership really mean? And this it really gets back to justification. So if I yeah. say I have a right to do something, um, uh, what I mean, what I really mean, and this is where I think you have to get more more technical. I think what you're inherently saying is that is that someone else's propositional argument that you that that you can't that what you're doing uh, is wrong cannot be justified. That means they can't give a coherent argument against it. Okay, that's a little bit. I think that's okay. really how you have to unpack the nature of what rights are. But you have to remember that. In a society where there is the actual factual possibility and reality of conflict, whenever people come together to try to find a rule or a norm to solve this conflict, the entire endeavor of that argumentation is an attempt to find an owner. Now, an owner means someone who's going to be recognized as having the right, the superior right to control the resource. So that's what they're trying to find out. What if it was Not just about? Need, yeah, yeah, what ahead. was? What if it was about trying to find a controller rather than owner? So not not so not somebody that has a right, just somebody that actually physically gets that resource. But that, well, then I think language here is 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 maybe the problem because if you just want to ask who the so in the law we distinguish between possession and between ownership. So right. I, a simple way to look at it, not exactly technically accurate, but would be possession is the actual control of something, right? And ownership is the right to control. So you, in that in that in that sense, you could distinguish between an owner and a possessor. So if I have a knife, and I'm the owner of the knife and the possessor, and you take the knife from me, you steal it. Now you possess the knife, but I still own it. Right. So, but if you if you just so if the dispute is a factual dispute about who is the possessor. Well, that's just not normatively interesting. I mean, why would you have a dispute about – so you took my knife, and we go to court to ask who has the knife? You see what I'm saying? So <laughs> we, so you, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to – when you say we just want to know who is the controller, I think you're really talking about ownership because we wouldn't really ask who is who is controlling it factually right now. It's going to be obvious who controls it. There wouldn't be a dispute if someone didn't have control of it and someone else wanted it. So is the so, claim that a, that ownership is inescapable, or yes. is it that control is inescapable? Well, or, or control, possession is it? Yeah. Control or possession uh, correspond to the uh, to the Austrian economics or the the praxeological concept of uh, of action, right? When in action you employ means, employ scarce means to achieve ends. Employing means is the dominion or use of some. Something in the world that that causally interferes with the way the world works to get you what you want, right? That is the use of something. That is what employment of means is. So that's yeah. a that's just a. So for example, Crusoe on a desert island, right? He engages in human action. He doesn't own anything because there's no other people for him to have a right claim against. Mm. He controls some things. He might build a hut or a, or, a, or a. So he's got use of these things and control. I mean, he might leave his fishing net on the other side of the island, and he doesn't. It's not within arm's reach, but he can go use it when he needs. It's available for his use. I see. When other people, are, when other people arrive on the scene, then there's an additional problem he has to face. Well, there's additional benefits he gets too, right? He has companionship, he has division of labor, he has the possibility of trade, cooperation, etc. But he he is he faces an additional problem. That there's there's one more danger in the world to him now that he has to face. Before he only had to face tigers and mosquitoes and uh, and starvation and drought and all this stuff, right? And disease. But now he's also got to face the possibility that there's another human actor whom he may have conflict with, who may want some of his resources. 
Um, or, or so, so, so he wants to possess and control a resource, but he wants to do so in a peaceful and quiet way, uh, where he doesn't have conflict with his neighbors, so that they can have trade and harmonious relationships instead of continually physically fighting each other. So, if other people feel the same way, they come together in society, and they attempt to come up with property laws, property rights. See, that's what – when you say ownership, all that really means is a property right, and every time we say the word right, we right. mean a property right. All rights are property rights. All laws are based upon some implicit conception of property rights. Um, all political theory, all legal theory, it all comes down to property rights. Who has the rightful ownership or control of a given resource? Okay, so so is the claim then that really even more fundamental than ownership being inescapable is the claim that rights are inescapable? Well, ownership means property rights, and whenever we have a normative dispute about a conflict over a resource, the participants in the dispute and everyone who's paying attention and arguing about it, they are all themselves talking about property rights. They're just disagreeing over who should be the owner of a resource, but none of them can dispute the concept of ownership. So now, what if you I... could have people – go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say you could have people that are not interested in this process, and these right. are basically renegade outlaws or renegades, and – Again, you just have to treat those people as a technical problem. They're they're like like very smart monkeys. <laughs> they're just like smart monkeys. And so that's how, in fact that's how I view the state. You know, that's how that's how I survive in my mind as a libertarian living with the state. I just I just view the state as a second uh, typhus, you know, that we have to deal with. Okay. Uh, so so how how would you deal with the claim then that uh there's no such thing as rights or that rights – so this is kind of halfway my position that rights are yes. concepts that yes. I love – like if everybody agrees to a, uh, play by the, the game of acting mm -hmm, as if mm -hmm. we have rights, while I love the conclusions, it's, I think it's a very logically consistent theory, but that still doesn't get you to this inescapability if rights are just kind oh, of a concept. I, I thought you were going to say if everyone agrees to play by the game as if we have rights, then effectively we do because that's what I would say in a sense. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't disparage it by calling it a game though right? because that, that's, that implies a type of moral cynicism or moral skepticism that I don't have. So the, the entire question, do rights exist, yeah. things like this, I think that's fraught with difficulty because it, 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 it plays into scientism a bit. Like you're trying to treat rights, and when you say it's just a concept, well, let's be let's be clear about all these things, right? I think then you have to have a whole theory of concept formation and epistemology, which is why I mentioned to you previous to our conversation uh, a, a lot of Ayn Rand's approach to concept formation and the way she just approaches knowledge. I think is is one of the the best that I've seen. I don't know if you have to go that way, but so I I would view that I would just try to look at this simply and realistically and clearly. And have clear terms. So I would say that we are rational beings, right? And we, we have the ability to have knowledge about the universe. Uh, that is factual knowledge and mm -hmm. other knowledge. Um, and our minds are complicated enough where we grasp so much. I mean, look, we have perceptual data. That's all we have, I believe. The five senses, as far as we know. And our brains integrate those percepts, as Rand would say, into concepts. And the concepts lead to higher level thinking. And then to communicate this and to think with others and to, and to make it more streamlined, we have language. So you have language that has words that correspond to concepts. So to say something is just a concept is kind of misleading. I mean, well, so let me give I you let me give you an example though. So if, if I were to say something right. like, um, if I go to a chess tournament, there are rules of the game I have to follow. There's good social rules if I want to participate. And I want to participate because I like going to chess tournaments, but the rules aren't something that are inescapable. I can just not follow them. I can I can Correct. Uh, consistently. But the, and it sounds like the claim is that with the argumentation ethics, it's not something that is escapable in the same way as a chess. The rules of a chess tournament are. It's not escapable because all all truth claims can have to be decided or decidable upon in argumentation. And therefore, if there are any particular ethics that come with argumentation as an activity, then that does delimit the universe of possible claims that could ever be justified. If you accept that there are such things as, as rights, I mean, is the what is the so with something so, okay, like a, okay. yeah. 
Well, back, back up for a second. So I, I, I look at it the other way. I think rights sort of is an outcome of a way of thinking about what's justified. That's just a, a conceptual term we, we, we apply to it. So, for example, the, the entire libertarian claim could, could just boil down to you can never justify aggression. Okay, let's, let's just assume we know what aggression is. Aggression cannot be justified. Now, what that means is aggression can't be argumentatively justified because every justification is, has to be done argumentatively, right? Okay. So when you say aggression can't be argumentatively justified, what you're saying is that actual people engaged in an actual argument are making certain presuppositions as a nature of the activity of the argumentation that means it is literally Im logically impossible for them to justify certain normative claims that would contradict the presuppositions of the argument. So to my mind, the only disagreement really that is left – that like, say someone like you could have, like as a libertarian, is do you believe that argumentation necessarily has certain normative presuppositions or not? So, like in the in the Murphy Callahan d debate that I had, they they seem to they seem to agree with me that they they agree that argumentation has some normative presuppositions. They weren't clear about what they were, and I don't think they understood the implications of them saying that. But once you admit that. The game is over. Well, so let's say I don't admit that. So if you don't admit that, then that's that's where the real dispute lies, right? But if you don't admit that, so, so then I would, uh, you know, like logically classify people into different camps than, than at that point. I mean, if you don't even want to argue at all, then you're just a brute, and then I, <laughs> again, I just have to treat you as a technical problem, right? Just like, you know, I, I can argue with an IRS agent about why taxation is wrong, and he can basically agree with what I say, but say anyway, pay your taxes. I've just got to regard him as a threat and keep an eye on him, right? I got to keep my hand on my wallet. Well, um, so I can I can say coherently though that in the process of arguing, you demonstrate um, possession of your of your body. But I can also coherently say in the process of argument, there's no such thing as legitimate ownership. Um, yeah, yeah, I, th I think yeah, I, I I get what you're getting at. Um, um, what you're I think what you're thinking is that you don't have to make any normative claims during an argument. Let me ask you though. So, when we're talking about you, you were talking about um, justification, and you said rights are kind of an out, maybe an outgrowth of justification or something that follows from justification. Where do you get this concept of justification? If I'm a justification skeptic and I say there's no such thing as any kind of objective justification, how do you how would you respond to that? Well, then, well, then you would lose in court <laughs> because you're. <laughs> you, 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 if you really don't want to object to my taking your property, then I'll just take it. <laughs> well, but it, but I, if you I, want, if you want, in other words, if you want to mount, if you want to mount a defense of your right, if you want to take my stuff, or if you want to keep your stuff, and we have a context, then you're you are in effect saying I'm the owner, not you. You, you can't. But, it's but it's sort of like saying. But, but it, you're, it, that's it, the case if if you accept this idea of ownership. But if I'm an ownership skeptic and I say all ownership is is a is a concept we come up with in our mind because it it benefits society if we all agree that there's such a thing as ownership. That right? I, I'm kind of I'm acknowledging that there is such a thing as a concept of ownership that has logical implications if you agree to it. But I'm saying really it's just. It's kind of an agreement that sometimes I'll follow and sometimes I won't. Well, I guess you could. It's convenient to come up with a situation where we're we're like these uh, um, angelic beings floating up in the clouds, just having an, uh, uh, an abstract argument about what these silly humans down on the earth squabbling over resources are arguing about, right? <laughs> and you could say, well, I just it's just gameplay. It's a game. I'm going to reject it. But the the point is that in any in any actual dispute about an actual conflict over any actual resources, the the two or more people that are part of the dispute both actually are they are claiming ownership of that resource. Okay. So I don't I don't see how they can claim ownership of it and then deny the concept of ownership. Okay. Okay. So what about this? How about this example? Is it possible for me to so I'm gonna try to coherently argue including the concept of ownership but get to getting to a non-libertarian conclusion. Let's okay. say that I say um, everybody that is under four feet tall owes me, yes. uh, or owes everybody who is over six feet tall, um, right. thirty percent of their income. 
that's not right. a libertarian principle, is that incoherent? Right. Yes. Uh, and we didn't get into that at all. That isn't the core part of Hoppe's argument. So what he what he goes into in his argument, um, uh, and this is where he gets a little Kantian, right? He says that um, there's something called the universalizability requirement. Okay. Uh, when, when you pro when you when you're in a sincere, honest discussion about what rules are going to be the adopted and just rules, um, you have to adduce reasons for your position. They cannot be just arbitrary. Okay. Now, to me, this is this is something. I think it took me a while to realize because it, it's kind of subtle, but uh, people sometimes will say something like, um, "Well, what's the argument for the universalizability principle?" Yeah. Okay. And again, universalizability means you can't have what was the opposite, which is called particularistic rules. A particularistic rule is like what sort of what you just said. It's saying like, um, okay. You and I both want ownership of this of this house. Uh, my argument for why I get it is because I'm me and you're not. <laughs> See, that's a particular that's particularistic. So you're not giving a reason what Hoppe would call grounded in the nature of things, some objective reason that we can both point to and see as the as the explanation behind so, your claim. So let's make it so, universal. We'll say all people over six feet tall because of their um, superior. Um, ability to see over obstacles. That's the universal uh, rule. And I'm not talking about individuals, though I happen to qualify. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it's a universal rule. Would that be incoherent? Well, I don't I, I mean I think personally that I don't I don't see that winning over people in arguments because it's the you are finding a distinction between people, but it's a distinction without a difference. In other words, uh, there, there's no there's no connection between that ability and the ability to own a resource. So I, I would say this. In, I don't know if we have time to go into this whole thing, but I, there is an entire aspect of the argument that deals with uh, the the need for making universalizable arguments. So it's hop. So let me give the example. Hop. He gives the example of a. Um, uh, you can avoid the the. The particularistic fallacy, so to speak, by just being clear, or, or you could say something like uh, all redheads, right? Then it's it's, but then it's just arbitrary. And to the extent your your rule is arbitrary, you are literally not giving a reason. And if you're not giving a reason, you're, you're not engaged in argumentation. Okay, okay. It's, well, it's I'll make essentially. It, I've yeah, got go I've got a better one for you. So okay. let's say this is be much more controversial. Let's say everybody. With an IQ under eighty, owes their fifty percent of their whatever they make to people with IQs over one hundred and twenty. Now the reason okay. is because the people with the higher IQs can more accurately, you know, can uh, uh, and make sounder investments, which makes everybody wealthier, and, and the other people would just squander their money. So that's an that's at least a line of argument that doesn't <laughs> seem totally arbitrary. Well, or just take it to the extreme. Just you can, we can have slavery. A caste system in slavery. The superior people own the inferior people because they know better than them. Or so, I mean, you could you could take this to the extreme, right? I think the problem with those arguments is they are incompatible with the more basic presuppositions that are already uh, have to be agreed to, which is basically um, any person, like let's say, that's capable of engaging in argumentation. They're, they're they have that kind of rational capacity. Right? They're basically a human actor in the world. Any person that is capable of being an actor and that is capable of being the first appropriator and user of a resource has a better claim than anyone else. And that basic argument does not depend upon their, uh, upon their quantity of intelligence. It just depends upon them being an actor. So it's sort of a binary thing. Once you're in the group, you have full rights. I mean, I love and so that. For you, I, I think that's yeah. consistent. But why would that be a superior in any way to me? Just saying, you know, it, it, saying everything because that it, you said, except I, I say, but because uh, it's well, because it's primary. So, in other words, it comes first, and it's the presupposition that we're basing everything on. So, if you come up with a second criteria, it's got to undermine and undercut the first one, right? So, in other words. It's just a fancy way of saying, I agree that that I agree that for purposes of for, for there to be argumentation, there has to be human life. For there to be human life, humans have to employ scarce means in the world. For them to employ scarce means in the world, 
someone has to be the first user of a resource, right? For someone to be the first user of a resource, he has to be free to take it and start using it. For there to be ownership, the latecomer principle applies, which means that you know, the, the, the person who first used a resource has a better claim to it than anyone else. So we agree to all this, and then you say, yeah, but we're still going to take it from the guy anyway because he's stupider. I mean that's really <laughs> what you're saying. So it's just, it's just a contradiction of all the essential pre presuppositions that you've come up with. In other words, if you, if you introduce a distinction – I mean how about a more realistic example? Blacks or women – at certain times in history, and it's in certain cultures even still today, are considered to be inferior to men or to white men, right? right. And therefore, um, the, the standard arguments that we came up with only apply to like white men or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Women don't have the right to engage in contract. They don't have the right to buy property, et cetera. Right. I mean this is an actual argument that's been used, and the argument is that the, uh, the women are the frailer sex. Blacks have a lower IQ. They're not as evolved. Whatever the arguments are, right? Right. But I, I think with these kind of grand questions, we have to really sit back and say, look, as really enlightened, liberal thinking, realistic people, is this a serious argument? Are we really saying they're not human actors? Are, are, are we really saying that it's impossible to imagine a black man alone on an island surviving and acting as a human, employing scarce means, or a woman? Yeah, I, it's just I, it's an it's an arbitrary distinction that is not grounded in the nature of things that everyone that's a potential arguer could could in principle agree to as being fair. Well, I find it. I mean, I find it persuasive, and I find the conclusions persuasive. But the thing that that's the sticking point for me is the notion of the inescapability of it. So I agree. It's yeah. not, and it ain't going to persuade a lot of people to say, "Oh, we're going to give these exceptions for women, and they they don't qualify." Totally not going to well, persuade anybody. Well, or at least well before we go, let me yeah. ask you. Let me let me give you one thing I, I haven't gotten to yet, and, and see what you think about this. Okay, especially when I deal with libertarians who are skeptics of argumentation ethics. Uh, not skeptics, really. I understand people being skeptical because this 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 entire area is confused and difficult, but. People that are outright hostile to it uh, drive me nuts, right? Um, so because here, here we have, you know, we don't have a case where I'm talking to my neighbor who's like, you know, a normie, and I'm trying to say, look, let's go back to principles. You agree with me that it, you should be fair to people and you shouldn't hurt people. Right now, if you just apply economic logic, you could, I'm, and then I try to persuade them to be a little bit more consistent, right? Whatever. I'm already talking to a fellow libertarian, you, and sometimes a fellow anarchist, which I think you probably are, right? Yep. yep. Um, and so now either you yourself have a justification for your normative views or you don't. Okay. If you don't, then what is the big fuss about? So you, you have these libertarians walking around with no good argument for their views, and they're upset that someone thinks that they do. I mean what's the difference really? I mean… Basically, in your view, everyone's walking around. It's it's just like this nihilistic desire to smash people. That it's like, look, I don't know why that I don't know why we should be libertarian, but you don't either. So shut up, you know. Well, so it's, it's a, that's like a nihilistic sort of impulse, I believe. Right. I'm I'm definitely partial, at least towards um, nihilistic ethics, with some exceptions. But, uh, okay. but what's I what's interesting though is I also see from the opposite point of view that. As annoying as those um, extreme, like uh, anti um, anti Hapesians are, there, it's mm -hmm. also on the other side that people who take argumentation ethics and say there's no, literally no coherent way to argue against these libertarian conclusions, and I don't. They try to bash that over the head. I don't find that productive either. <clears throat> wait a minute. Wait, you you lost me. So you're. The Hoppians lose you, or the anti-Hoppians there? No, no, it's uh, I see it from the other side as well. From the the Hoppian, I don't want to say all oh, Hoppians, but there are, there's definitely a a flavor of argument when people take this is something true not just in rationalist ethics, but in all types of rationalist reasoning. Yeah, 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 yeah. They yeah. say you you know you can't disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no coherent yeah. argument against it, and if you disagree with any part, it's because you're stupid. I think that also is a totally yeah, yeah. unproductive. Oh, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't disagree with you on on that on that as a tactical or strategical matter. But here's the thing: L let's suppose that let's suppose that you are a libertarian. Okay, that means you do believe. And I don't think most libertarians are like totally ethical relativists, right? They they actually do believe that their libertarian ethic is superior in some way 
to competing ethics, right? Right. I don't. They they might not be able to adduce reasons for it, good reasons, but they do think that they're they are right, right? Which right. means that they effectively do believe that an argument for socialism is wrong, for some reason, right? Right. They do believe that an argument for socialism is incoherent, for some reason. They right. do believe that already. Almost every libertarian, even non Hoppians, implicitly believes that libertarianism is the only justifiable argument, and, and then – and because it is true that all justification has to be done argumentatively, they believe that libertarianism is the only one that's argumentatively justifiable. So they right. must believe to some degree that an argument for socialism is argumentatively incoherent, right. and yet – they attack Hoppians for basically saying that. <laughs> Do you yeah. see? So it's 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 kind of bizarre to me that people who basically agree with what he's saying attack him for saying what they believe. Right, and I, I think it I think it's about that the rationalist like for me a, at least um, because I place such high value on rationalist reasoning. I think it's if yeah, done correctly, yeah. it's the most profound way of reasoning. Those initial steps before you get to, um, you know, a, if we agree on ownership, then X, Y, and Z follow. It's just it's getting to that agreement on ownership. Is that something that's truly inescapable? That's where I think, you know, there's needs to be – there's a lot of room for okay, reasonable yeah. skepticism here. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. So, But, but let me – from your part, point of view, let's say you do believe libertarianism is the most coherent, intellectually defensible, justifiable uh, you know, ethical position. So you have to believe that socialism is not intellectually defensible, right? Yeah, uh, um, so I would – here's the way that I would put it because I'm partial towards the ethical nihilism with – there's one big exception with, uh, with my ethical okay. nihilism. That I think it is the case that if people in society agree to principles of ownership and understand them – almost identically as we understand um, the rules of chess tournaments, then mm -hmm. society flourishes and yes. you get a maximization of not just peace, not just prosperity, but the ability for individuals to love, which that is my, yeah. that is my ethical value where I think that is, that kind of grounds my ethics is yeah. love is the good. And so that system which maximizes the love is the good system. Yeah. And I, I would even myself disagree with what you just said. Um, and let me make one other point. I don't think that the Hoppian argumentation ethic is is really meant as a way to strategically persuade people. Right. Uh, it's not that kind of argument. As I said, most people – look, society couldn't exist in my view without people mostly being decent and seeing these things practically, intuitively, and other ways. Um, I was a libertarian before I read Hoppe. It's just that when I read it, I was like, oh, this is so – it makes so much sense, and it was like intellectually pleasing to me as someone interested in the theory of things. Do you follow right. me? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've had a bunch of socialists out there doddering along, and they read Hoppe's argumentation ethics in 1988 Liberty magazine, and they go, oh, now I'm going to be a libertarian. <laughs> but that's that's really more a question of how to persuade people or tactics or strategy or psychology or something like that. So I, it's not that this is supposed to open people's eyes, and it, but it is supposed to be a way to demonstrate to libertarians uh, why it is, like why it logically is that no one is able to to defend a system competing with ours. No one's able to justify socialism. It's just contrary to the nature of things. I mean, it, well, they're, in, they're in, not in, able to justify yeah. socialism given the presuppositions of this type of universal ownership uh, principle. Yes, but the thing is when they engage in – argumentation is a peaceful activity. This is what peace people do when they come together. They're trying to be civilized. They're trying to respect each other. They're trying to find a way to work with each other in this world of possible conflict, and the people that are trying to do that… Now, I believe that it's because of evolution and psychology. I mean humans, because of the way we evolved, we have a social nature, but there is an advantage to being in, you know, in, 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 in society with each other in, in communities. Uh, but that gives rise to the possibility of conflict, and it gives rise to human feelings of empathy 
So I, I think that, for example, um, and I think uh, the free market enhances empathy, but empathy, to my mind, is the kind of root source of rights in the sense that it makes us value other people, not just ourselves. And, but mm. to the extent you value other people, that's these are the type of people that engage in these inquiries in the first place. I mean even our opponents are basically civilized, so they recognize the, the grun norms, the basic norms that we do. They just go way off track, I think, because there's so much baggage and there's so much economic illiteracy and there's so much confusion you know, about individualism versus the collective goods and things like that. Right? Uh, you know, one of the biggest problems is the state is viewed as this kind of background entity that is separate from us that is necessary and uh, permanent and has to be taken into account, and there's special rules for the state. Right, that lets people use the state as a safety valve for all the things they don't understand. They just shove it into the state. In their personal lives, they would never rob their neighbor. Right, but they will consent to the state robbing their neighbor. Yeah, I, I think when you ex expand on even kind of commonsensical ethical n intuitions that people have, I do think it leads to some kind of a some version of an anarchism. Um, even though people don't immediately see that's where it leads. But this has been an awesome conversation. I have enjoyed it. Uh, we can do it again anytime on another topic if you like. Excellent. All right, that was my conversation with Mr. Norman Stephen Kinsella. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Wherever you fall on this particular argument, I hope that clarified things. I think many proponents of argumentation ethics are a bit too strong-headed in how certain and complete and absolute and unquestionable the ideas are, and I think many people who criticize argumentation ethics are a bit too quick to do so. I think there's some middle ground here. I'm definitely not totally on board yet, but I think there is some truth to be discovered when at least thinking about some values that we demonstrate that we presuppose when we're in the process of argumentation. So though I'm not a rationalist ethicist yet, I've got an open mind and I'm still ready to be persuaded. Obviously there's a lot more to say on this issue but not today. That's all for me. I hope you guys have a great week.